Hey everybody, welcome to the Hogwarts Legacy Gameplay Showcase. I'm Chandler Wood, Community Manager here at Avalanche Software, and I'm honored to introduce you to our panel today. First up, we have community guest host, Ben Snow. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and from the Avalanche team, we have game director, Alan Tu. Hello everybody. And systems designer, Mackenzie Toner. Hi. And finally, just off screen capturing gameplay for us, Andrew Corum. <laughs> Today we'll be giving you a taste of the open world via broom flight, a deeper look at combat using the Dark Arts Battle Arena, and a look at your personalizable home within Hogwarts, the Room of Requirement, where we may even see some beasts. And we're starting right where we left off in our last gameplay showcase, just outside Hogwarts, which I, I love that we can, you can walk out of the castle after w walking through everything and then just come out here and take off on your broom out into the open world. And Alan, I know that's something that you particularly like about yeah. Hogwarts Legacy too. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a big fan of just being able to hop on the broom and, <laughs> and go anywhere. There's something about kind of like the the sensation of of everything being open to you, and just I love the proximity that I can get to things. I love flying close to the ground, and and I I, I kind of wanted to talk about it just because I feel like um, you know the brooms are fun for me not just because of all those feelings of exhilaration. But, but because they're not just, I have a broom and it's done. Uh, I actually kind of like some of the mechanics in it. So you can, you see in the lower right, there's a meter there. And, and occasionally as Andrew's kind of flying up or flying down, you might notice it, it draining or not. And, and this isn't the present day where all the broom technology is well known and advanced and, and, and everything that we know and love. This is an earlier time where they're still trying to figure out, you know, we're not at the 3,000 yet, we're at the, like, <laughs> we're at the 11. So. Oh my goodness, I just, I'm just so <laughs> speechless right now because this is just so beautiful. The world just looks so... By the way, the, the broom, is that like the only one? Or can you like upgrade that broom to go faster? Yeah, so we have a shop in Hogsmeade, actually a broom oh. shop. And so that sells a variety of different brooms. And it was important to us that the player could customize themselves based on their own aesthetic. So they're purely cosmetic, but uh, if you talk to the shopkeep uh, and help him out, he'll actually sell upgrades. Yeah, and those, those upgrades will make it so that where normally the broom, you can only fly, um, you can only go at max speed. It's kind of like a turbo meter down there. You mm -hmm. can only go at max speed without the meter going down kind of closer to the ground. And as you raise into the air, you'll notice the meter drop. And so those upgrades will allow you to increase that distance from the ground. And the, the broom owner at, at the sporting goods store in, in Hogsmeade is trying to perfect the broom and get better at it and, and know it better. And you can participate that and get better and better brooms through that. I see. <laughs> and I, I love that that mechanic encourages you to actually explore the world and kind of stay close to the ground. It's not just a travel mechanic, point A to point B. You're not just flying high over everything, although it is beautiful, something I really love doing, but as well, there's lots to lots to explore on the ground, and so kind of keeping you down at the ground level. And to me, it feels like it's got this kind of surfing vibe over the... Yeah. Over oh my the God, like, I'm just like, I want to snatch the controller from Andrew right now because I want to go to the mountaintop, I'm going into the forest, and to that hamlet, or well, well, I, I don't know if that's how it's called. <laughs> I think that's what it is. No, no it's awesome. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're actually going to land here, and I, I feel like... I feel like that you call it a hamlet is 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 just perfect, just because that's what we refer to it <laughs> as. And so, uh, we all know from lore that Hogsmeade is the only all wizarding village within Britain. But we wanted other opportunities to kind of meet other characters out here yeah. and to kind of populate the landscape, so it's not just kind of you know barren as you leave out this direction and that direction. And so we just imagine these different dwellings, these different smaller locations that that wizards might live in out in the Scottish Highlands. And so it's those. Uh, and so we refer to those as hamlets, and they're opportunities to learn those wizard stories, um, how those different locations have kind of like learned to live, what their relationships are with characters at Hogsmeade and Hogwarts. And so they're both quest opportunities out here and a chance to kind of get to know more of the area, even beyond Hogwarts and Hogsmeade that we've already experienced. And you'll also notice on the mini-map, like lots of little icons, and each one of those represent gameplay in, in the hamlets that you can participate in, you know, whether it's a vendor or different puzzles and challenges or different secrets that exist. Um, each one of those icons are different opportunities for gameplay. And you'll notice that, that same thing as we venture out into the open world as well. So when you go out into the open world and you see, see those icons, whether they're on the mini-map or on your map or off in the distance, those things are opportunities to say, like, I want to increase my inventory capacity. There are puzzles left behind by 
old wizards, you know, that you can solve that actually grant you those. Uh, if you see ruins off in, the, off in the distance and you visit them, you might find opportunities to actually expand and learn about your ancient magic. And as you, and as you kind of encounter different enemies dotted on the landscape, sometimes those characters, uh, poachers or dark wizards, might be hoarding different uh, magical resources that are valuable to you as you're playing the game. So each one has kind of like a way to connect to our gameplay loops and provide different opportunities that just kind of reward you for poking around. Them. I mean, I right away when I want to just cover all of those <laughs> points on the map, just been going over there. Well, well, we've flown on a broom already, but there is something that we haven't done so far, and that is uh, getting on our flying mount. Um, we're gonna hop on our Onyx Hippogriff here. The Onyx Hippogriff is our pre-order bonus. Oh my God, there he just like pops out of the, <laughs> the back. Oh wait, you can use it as a horsey? I mean, a horse, I mean, that is a, a horse. <laughs> yeah, um, as a Hippogriff, you can, you can totally ride it like a ground mount and you can lift off into the air. And we tried to make sure that each, each each of those interactions, so the broom's really good at reaching that top speed, at, at kind of traveling the world as quickly as possible. But sometimes it's really nice to get on the Hippogriff because of that ground speed uh, or those transitions. Uh, and sometimes it just feels amazing just to be riding around on a Hippogriff. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, it's, it, it really is kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's a great feeling being on it. And it's a great feeling managing those transitions, kind of going from run to fly and just being able to go wherever you want. And we tried to make sure that that, the, that each one of these things that you can interact with have, have a unique identity and a reason for being. Oh, and, oh my God, like I see like different like areas, like a swampy area. By the way, can you go to like entire map anywhere you go? Are there are regions that are like locked from you? Yeah, as soon, like... as, as soon as you, there's kind of a moment where the world kind of opens up to you outside of Hogwarts as a student. And right from that moment, uh, early on in the game, you can go wherever you want. And so you might find more difficult challenges in different areas. And you'll see different spots as Andrew's moving around, like you mentioned the swamp. Um, but there, we have got like a coast and we've got different types of environments out in the world just to kind of uh, pepper your experience, reward you for exploring, keep things fresh. Uh, all those things exist as we're moving around. So cool. I love that windmill. It's like so rustic. Like I keep forgetting that this is like 1800s. The Wizarding World we've never really seen before. <laughs> like it feels so authentic. Like it just, it, it, it's part of it. Yeah, I, I love this vista too. and and. I'm gonna have Andrew stop here. We're gonna use a bit of dev magic to uh, change the seasons. Actually, I want to see. I want you to see what this world looks like, uh, covered in snow. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, please. I love snow. That's all I want. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh my God! This is so beautiful. Oh my goodness! This is so pretty. Like, it looks so realistic. Oh my god, it changes the landscape like completely. Oh my god, does it have like actual like gameplay impact? Like impact on the gameplay? Or does it like, it's just the weather of Scotland? Uh, yeah, we use it, we really use it as a narrative marker through, through the game. So as you're progressing through your main storyline, it was important for us to kind of like have those moments that kind of felt like when you're reading the books or watching the movies where you know you'll see kind of like the title card winter and, <laughs> and now the landscape has changed and, and you're really feeling those that passage of time while you're a student you know going through your year in right. Hogwarts and I think I think we wanted to duplicate that and for me it's really fun that it's not just on the outside which which I, I agree I think it looks <laughs> really beautiful um, but within the school as well so there are moments like when it reaches certain holidays or things like that where Hogsmeade oh, uh, reacts to God. holidays and the school reacts to holidays and you see the decorations around those environments change um, nice. that really help just kind of make me feel like I'm there right. yeah. and oh, and it's not just uh, it's not just you know for the seasons those those kind of vibe things um, like we have a day night cycle and that right. day night cycle mm -hmm. It, even though similarly, like it's largely about vibe, when you go into Hogsmeade in the evening, there's less characters there. Uh, around the school, you'll notice it kind of dies down and quiets down. Oh, just when there's right, just yeah. candlelight and students kind of like as you're walking through the halls. But in that day night cycle is where we've kind of placed uh, a few items where, you know, whether or not you can collect them or whether or not you can interact with them with, that are a little bit restricted by the day night cycle. And I love Andrew's flying up here, really high up on the hippogriff. And, and we're just looking at this view of Hogwarts in the distance. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's part of what I love most about flying around in this game, whether it's on a hippogriff or, or, or on the broom. No, I, I mean, you talk about going anywhere and things that you can see in the distance, and that's one of my 
I I still can't get over like it, no matter I play this so much, but I still I still can't get over the fact that I can see Hogwarts out there, and there's just something beautiful about knowing that all of all of the things inside of it, the classrooms, the students, the professors, um, all the places I can go, I can just fly my hippogriff, land in the courtyard, enter the front doors, and just walk you know, to the library, to class, or to greenhouse, or to my common room, that it's all contiguous, and just kind of like one one space is still exciting to me after all this I time. mean, I'm just, just <laughs> I'm speechless right now. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's just, oh my God. As much as we want to spend a lot more time out here just flying around, experiencing the world, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to switch over to combat. And last time we gave you kind of a, an intro to combat, this time we're going to really go uh, a okay, lot more deeper. of a deep dive on uh, <laughs> using the Dark Arts Battle Arena, which is part of our Deluxe Edition. All right, Andrew's got us in the Forbidden Forest, which is where the Dark Arts Battle Arena is. Uh, which is part of the Deluxe and Digital Deluxe Edition. I, I, I love the way that the Dark Arts Battle Arena is actually uh, part of the world. It's integrated into the world. So your experience is more immersive than just choosing an option from, from the main menu of the game or something like that. Reason to go to the Forbidden Forest. Exactly. Well, there, there are many reasons <laughs> to go to the Forbidden Forest, but uh, he's also wearing the uh, Dark Arts Cosmetic set. Mm. And uh, here he's pulling out the Thestral, which is oh my God. part of that Dark Arts pack <laughs> from the Deluxe and Digital Deluxe Edition. So we're going full full Dark Arts here. Um, That's good. That's what I like going down. But I like this, uh, this battle arena. It is a great place to show off um, really combat in a big way because it unlocks some interesting abilities for you and, and allows you to, to uh, really play around with uh, combat in a, in a deep way. And is this like the only arena like this in the game where you can like practice? And yeah, do so in the, in the base game, we have uh, two combat arenas normally. That, and so everyone mm -hmm. has access to those. And each of the combat arenas are an opportunity to kind of just go through a difficult combat challenge, fight through multiple waves in order to uh, earn a, uh, a different cosmetic for your character and add that to your collection. Um, in the case of the, that's no different than the Dark Arts Battle Arena, that's also true, uh, the Combat Arena. But, uh, but uh, one of the things that we're excited about in the Dark Arts Battle Arena that people can do is, is you come in preloaded with different abilities. So uh, the Unforgivable Curses are something that everyone's going to have access to through the base game and going to be able to earn. Mm -hmm. And they can make choices in order to kind of like add that to their repertoire. And they can also commit to that down with certain talents and things like that. When you, when you play the Dark Arts Combat Arena, you actually have access to all those things as kind of like a, a way to test them all. And so it's a chance to kind of like tour and play with the Dark Arts and decide whether or not that is a path that you kind of want to go down. Um, but, but yeah, okay. everyone has the same ability to explore, explore the Dark Arts. This is just kind of like a way of previewing. And again, a great place for us to show off combat in general. Uh, so I think we're going to jump in here, Andrew's going to start, just start battling and we can start talking about uh, everything you're seeing on the screen. All right. <laughs> oh, he just said about the cadavers right away. Oh my God. <laughs> we're, start, we're starting off strong. We're oh my God. Is that, is that, was that Kujio? Oh my God. That's so cool. Yeah, so that, You'll, you'll notice right away, like when we use Avada Kedavra, that guy's health bar went from instant to zero. And we really are trying to honor the way Avada Kedavra works in the game, uh, even in some pretty extreme situations. Um, you'll notice that like the the meter takes up a, a lot longer to yeah, a little uh, kind cool of down. build up as a way to kind of deal with its extreme power, just so that it's still fun to use. And then there's some some ways that we'll probably talk about to 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 adjust that. But I don't know. I, I don't know if there are things on the screen that you just have questions about. Well, like, we're, like I see like little blue things pop, uh, pop <laughs> from yeah. the enemies. <laughs> also, before, like that sign. Well, it's like so in the community we call it the ancient magic sign. And I don't know if that's how it's called. Yeah. <laughs> in the game. So the community is astute. So uh, on the development side and in player facing in the game, we reference that as your ancient magic meter. Oh, so it is ancient magic. <laughs> that is, yeah. So as your as your abilities in the game keep growing and you become exposed to some of the secrets about your own kind of history and your own your own abilities, um, you start unlocking new powers. So one of those powers you'll see the R1 button appearing uh, throughout the game. Uh, that's an ancient magic throw, we call it, that allows you to kind of like draw an object to you and fling it at an enemy. 
Um, okay. But whenever you see the R1 or the L1 plus R1 appear over somebody's head, mm -hmm. um, that's an ability to cast a, a very devastating and powerful uh, ancient magic spell oh, to do a ton of damage against the character. I see, I see. And the way that manifests itself uh, depends on the type of enemy that you're fighting. And you'll see a, a wide variety of enemies in here that are pressuring the player in different ways. You'll notice there's there's uh, abilities that kind of bubble up under the player as he's fighting that force him to move. And there's different ways that we want the player to kind of move around on the battlefield. And that's actually a good link to the Ancient Magic meter in general. And the reason I say that is because as you're doing different things in combat, you're protegoing and you're doing different abilities and you can kind of spec into it with your talents, there are different ways to get that meter to build faster and faster. But one of the most effective base ways to build up that meter fast, that way you can launch these devastating attacks whenever you want to, is, is to actually perform combos. So you see that combo appearing. And it's almost like your, your emotions are building up. Mm -hmm. And then basically that builds up enough that you can attack someone. But as the combo meter builds up, at some point you strike someone and a, a piece of their magic kind of falls out of them. You'll see these blue orbs in, in, the, in the game world. And there's something that only you can see in, in the narrative, in the world. And it's another reason to move around on the battlefield. If you can go up and collect those things and but them in, they give big, big jumps to that ancient magic meter as we're playing. We're talking a lot about uh, about spells uh, and magic here, but I think there's another huge component of combat, and that is the the tools that you can bring to combat as well to kind of uh, change the way you play. And I think Mackenzie uh, knows a lot about what's going on with the plants yeah. and potions. And so the the tools are really interesting because they're basically like a prior investment. So you can bring the potions and the plants that you grow in the Room of Requirement to combat uh, to essentially kind of help you um, defeat enemies a lot quicker and, and more efficiently. So some of the tools that you'll see here are like the rock skin potion. So uh -huh. that is something that basically it covers your skin in this like rocky material that uh, reduces the incoming damage that you're receiving. So against big enemies, hard-hitting enemies like trolls, um, that's super helpful. <laughs> um, it's oh my god, she's <laughs> just destroying. The, the troll just collapsed from one of the kid uh, Obviously, we have the Wigan Will Potion as well, uh, which increases your health. And then we have the Focus Potion. So when Alan talks about having to balance a Vata Kedavra with a long cooldown, because obviously it's an instant kill, uh, one thing that you could do is brew a focus potion, and that will increase um, how quickly your your cooldowns uh, regain. Right. Oh my god, there's just so much like a, a versatility, like in what the character is doing to the troll right now. Like he's just bouncing around around the arena. He's like not, and the troll makes him move around too. Looks like. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that our plants are violent. <laughs> yes, and so that's like when we're talking about the almost the uh, setup of the arena, you also have plants that you can fight with. And so we have things like the venomous tentacula that you can put down and it acts like a turret and it just kind of shoots enemies around the battlefield. That is so cool. This is like a truly like Hufflepuffian way to approach <laughs> the battle. <laughs> yes. Exactly. No, that was super important to us, that there were these like multiple ways. And so you can see there's there's a ton of different things you can use. Uh, the Mandrake is one, so you can pull it out and it stuns with its like piercing cry, these enemies uh, in, in a radius. And another thing I want to call out uh, that we're seeing on the side of the screen here is these, these dueling feats, which I, I love because I love anything that prompts me to play a game in a different way, a unique way. I don't want to get stuck in my style, you know? Uh, and, and so this is a way to, if you want to get stuck in your style, go for it. If you just want to blast people with spells, go for it. But we also want to uh, have some things over here that may make you use certain plants or certain potions or block more or... Yeah, we mentioned the field guide challenges um, uh, in the prior stream. And the field guide challenges, this is the way that the field guide manifests like challenges for you to do in combat. And exactly to your point, um, we just wanted a way to encourage players to to explore the different systems, to help them decide, to just kind of practice with them and explore what they want to do. Because there really are so many different ways that you can push talents. Uh, when you see the the green X's on characters, that's right, and that's kind of a, through your talents you can unlock this kind of cursing mechanic that sort of like links the fates of these different characters on the battlefield. That way, uh, as you get the, the as you're cursing different characters, they all begin sharing damage, and so. We have things like Avada Kedavra, which is the insta-kill, but if you curse everyone before you insta-kill this one guy, they can all drop dead for that kind of ultimate so cool. oh, 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 oh. golden war fantasy. Oh, 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 oh.
And so oh my God. <laughs> there are there are dark arts fantasies. There's fantasies about being more of a defense against the dark arts character, things like that. That misty step that you see um, occasionally being used on the battlefield. And we can also spec into our potions and plants to make them more powerful and more efficacious. So it's wow. all about which type of player you feel like you are and whether or not you want to play with prep on the fly or with deliberation. And those are all different options. That is so cool because like it's like I see so much like going on on the screen, just so much complexity. And I, I want to just try it myself, like which style works best. I mean, I feel like it's the dark arts is gonna be the easiest <laughs> route, but I, you're, that you're ancient audience. magic, to be honest, feels like much more powerful than just the dark arts. Yeah. And speaking of plants and potions, we are going to be putting the dark arts away, put those unforgivable Aww. curses away, uh, and heading to the Room of Requirement, which is your home within Hogwarts, a personalizable space uh, that actually has some utility as well, where you get to brew things and grow things and uh, uh, also care for some beasts. <laughs> All right, Andrew's got us in the Room of Requirement uh, wearing, we, we kind of went casual mode on the outfit here, wearing a nice jumper. Um, and, and I think that's a, a good jumping off point, jumping off point, uh, <laughs> for uh, the personalization of the space as well. Not just your character and, and the visuals of your character, but actually this space is a, a place that you can make your own. Um, yeah, it was super important to us that this space really did feel like um, your reflection uh, as a wizard. So you can change the architecture in here. What? Uh, <laughs> different themes throughout, uh, starkly different themes uh, to really just hammer home that this is this is yours. You oh my God, <laughs> what? <laughs> this is beautiful. We never expected that to be, oh my God. That's the thing is not only can you change the architecture here, but you can actually conjure little objects uh, into this space, as you can see. So. You know, there's like statues that you can do and ornaments and tables and rugs and just a bunch of little things that really flesh out the space and bring it to life. Oh my goodness, because like we, we had an idea that those places where you brew stuff, that's where you can change, but you can do all of this. Where do you even get this stuff? Like there's a furniture store? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we call them conjurations. Uh, and the conjuration recipes can be purchased at Tomes and Scrolls in Hogsmeade. Um, but also as you engage in different types of gameplay throughout the world, you'll be rewarded with uh, different objects. That's so cool. And you change color? Mm -hmm. You can change the color, you can change the size of it, and you can place it basically anywhere. Oh, oh my god, it's so tiny! <laughs> it's like for baby Niffler. <laughs> and I love how the, the system too is designed, it, it's not mechanical, it's immersive. Mm -hmm. And so you get the magical effect of conjuring it in and you're 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 actually doing this in the world as your character, but it, the, the way you blended like that gameplay with yeah. the, the immersive uh, uh, design of personalizing oh the space. Oh my god! Like, and I love the animation how it like appears. You know, like it's not just like there. It's like it almost like mm -hmm. it apparates. It is really quite beautiful, and that was the thing is we wanted that to look really nice because the magic in the wizarding world is everywhere. It's it's physical, it's kinetic, and it's whimsical. And we really wanted to nail that whimsy in the space. Uh, another thing that I wanted to discuss is that not only can you like conjure things and you can change their their look, but you can do that with the utility objects as well. So you can see that we have planting pots and potion stations, and you can change the look of those uh, as well. And these are the areas where, as we had mentioned previously, you'll be growing your plants, you'll be brewing your potions. Right, 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 right. So while you're also Doing these uh, like kind of nurturing based activities, this is also the space uh, where you would bring your gear, gear to be identified and gear to have um, like rates put on it, which I believe Alan can talk to. Oh, yeah. Um, I, we keep bringing up appearance and, and how it looks and and on a, like uh, in the game, you can look like anything you want to whenever you want to. Um, but the player will be finding different types of gear that we call it uh, as you progress through the game. Mm -hmm. And essentially we just know that that clothes and different items in the wizarding world can have different magical properties. And as you, uh, as you explore and as you adventure and as you defeat enemies, you're going to be finding different pieces of gear um, that have different abilities and that can help you in your journey and are a major part of you kind of growing as a wizard and advancing as a wizard. Oh, and so- There's a huge list. <laughs> <laughs> and not all the time, uh, whenever, whenever you get a new piece of gear, you don't necessarily know exactly what it does. 
And so there is a station inside of the room of requirement that you can conjure. It's one of the first things you conjure uh, called an identification station where you can actually bring that, that gear that you're uncertain about and learn what its abilities are. Right, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and then as the space advances even further and the space will eventually grow its own rooms and you're gonna get new recipes, you know, like, like Mackenzie's talking about, all these different things keep expanding. And as it expands, eventually you're going to earn what we see here, which is called a loom. And when you set up a loom, it's a, an ability to essentially customize exactly which magical properties are on your gear and take any piece of gear and adjust its properties and to tweak what it does. And I mentioned earlier that, that you can make anything look like anything. The collection of, of, cus, uh, of um, appearances, we call it, mm -hmm. or um, cosmetics, we've been referring to it right. in this stream. Those types of things you can use and you can apply a look to any other other look. So if you get a piece of gear, you put it on, you look like that, but you can change it to look like whatever you want. That's so cool. And, and it, like you just you can just put some ability to this sweater, but then you can just swap yeah. that ability. Yep. And uh, appearances you can edit whenever you want in the gear screen. The loom is specifically about applying uh, traits and, and applying uh, larger upgrades that just kind of grant you greater statistical advantage or give you really specific abilities that w blend in nicely with where you're trying to go with your combat fantasy or talents and things like that. Interesting. I'm just like, I'm just seeing that, that they're just like pumpkin fur, moon cuff fur. What, where does that come <laughs> from? Yeah. And so you'll notice that the ingredients that are used to add traits uh, and to upgrade your gear uh, are based around beasts. So this is where we get into the beast care uh, section, which is inside this vivario, oh. kind of bigger space on the inside idea. And so you can see here we have a couple of beasts out. We have a grab horn and a moon calf <laughs> and a niffler uh, and a kneesel as well. So oh uh, quite god. a variety. <laughs> oh my god, he's just like a big puppy. <laughs> they're I so love their cuddling. <laughs> oh my god, they're together. Oh, that's so cute. They are adorable. And so part of beast care uh, is petting them as well, but feeding them too. And so once you do those things, that's when they feel safe enough that they can, they'll give you their, their magical ingredients. So mooncalf fur, um, niffler fur, etc., cetera, uh, that can then be used in your, in your gear. That is like so like intuitive because like, you know, that makes sense because when you touch the animals, you get some fur mm -hmm. leftovers. That's so, oh my God. Yeah, and we really want to hammer home the fact that this is like a home that you're making for them. So in the overland, you can find these beast dens uh, and rescue these beasts. Part of doing so is crushing them and feeding them <laughs> food as well, uh, and to build that relationship with, with your beast. In addition to be able to care for beasts, you can actually uh, conjure things in this space as well. Uh, the house, the cottage. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> And so we have like a lot of little ornaments uh, in this area. And a lot of them are purely cosmetic, but they look really cool. Again, it's the personalization uh, of this space. Oh my goodness. No, this is like, I'm going to spend eight hours <laughs> just designing <laughs> this whole area to personalize. This is like cool. It's like you have this little play area, like a, a personalized fish tank, so to say. <laughs> <laughs> just for the creatures, I love it. Yeah, no, totally. And there's like a decoration aspect, but there's also, we, we were saying inside uh, as well, is there's a utili uh, utility aspect to it oh. too. So as you uh, progress in the game and you're able to purchase more conjurations, you're able to speed up your process. So one of them, for example, is the food processor, which uh, it allows for the beasts in the space to automatically get feed, so you don't have to do it manually. Uh, and so you're, you're really building the progression for yourself here. Um, in addition, there's also a toy box where you can, oh, <laughs> where you can play with your beasts. And you'll see here, yeah, so you can, um, there's a bunch of toys in it, uh, and each beast has their own favorite toy. So as you can imagine, the moon calf really likes the moon ball, uh, or the needle <laughs> as like a little cat really likes to chase the yarn ball as well. Right. <laughs> and they're oh super my. cute. Oh my god. Watching them, it's so cute. <laughs> And the big thing we really wanted to hammer home uh, is that the world is a dangerous place. And so by going and rescuing these beasts and bringing back them back here uh, and caring for them, you're really helping helping them out. There's poachers in the overland uh, who want to who hunt these beasts for their material. So instead, you're you're caring for them. You're giving them a home. Right. Oh my God, this grab horn is just gigantic. <laughs> But he looks like my dog. My <laughs> dog right now, for sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, you could actually name them as well. So, like oh, your yeah. dog. 
So getting back into that personalization, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we, we didn't want you to just like throw in, oh, here's a, here's a grab horn in here. Like this can be named whatever Andrew's about to name them. Bruce. Bruce, the good name. <laughs> nice. uh, you know, we, we've we've created this really nice space, and and uh, you you can get additional vivariums, correct? Uh, it's a different kind of aesthetics and looks to where you're keeping yeah. your beasts and caring for them. Progression is a big part of this space as well. So, as you progress through the story, uh, you will unlock more vivariums. So, as you can see, this one's quite meadow themed, um, big, open, bright. Uh, but there's other ones, say like a swamp that you might encounter, um, and it's really a visual effect to uh, and more space for for your beast. Oh, so it's like those so when we're inside the room requirement. There's like on the left, there's that moon glow from one entrance and then some shrubbery going on in the right. Is that what you're talking about? Yep, that's exactly it. Ah, oh, you put trees in here too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and another thing with the, the beast care that I think is, is great, uh, you know, tying back to the same kind of thing that you did with like the broom, where the broom is not just a, a method of travel, it's, it's actually built in and integrated into the world. In the same way, like beast care isn't just this this added element. You're not just throwing it on top. There's really this like narrative and, and integration to yeah, everything, everything connects. So as you progress through the missions, you'll expand the space. Um, as you earn resources, you'll go into Hogsmeade and, and use them to uh, unlock the gameplay here and, and unlock new conjurations and different things to play around with. In the open world, uh, it's in those different um, in those different environments, like the different combat and conflicts and bandit camps and different things like that that exist in the Overland. Those things are what hold recipes uh, that exist in the loom. So all these things have a way of connecting. Um, moonstone that you find out in the world is the resource that we use to conjure everything that's found throughout the world. Um, forgeables are used for recipes. So really everything's like a everything's like a cycle and keeps you coming back. But even with the story that's being told too, I, you know, I think people know who Poppy is and and uh, that she has a particular affinity for beasts. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think everything we're seeing here, you know, you're going to be venturing out into the world, uh, and and this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, even even of kind of like your interactions with beasts in that narrative. So you know, you bringing up Poppy, there are more there are more uh, kind of mysteries to discover and things to discover out in the world that have to do with her and that have to do with caring for beasts. And so different characters have their own have their own stuff uh, uh, that that just kind of make this all just kind of like the beginning, the, be the beginning of your journey. Well, we could spend hours in here, but we're going to have to end the stream now. What do you think <laughs> about what you've seen today? I mean, this is, I'm just so blown away by how how beautiful it looks. The open world seems so detailed and there's so many things to do and like the combat, we're gonna have, we're gonna spend like two weeks or more just breaking it down by pieces. There's just so much to this world. Like I'm so happy you guys did this overall gameplay. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've got more for you to discover and find on your own. <laughs> Thank you for so much for being here. Thank you for watching. Hogwarts Legacy is available for pre-order now. It releases February 10th with 72-hour early access for owners of the Collector's Deluxe and Digital Deluxe Edition. We're gonna wrap things up, but first we've got a little surprise for you. Bye.